I go in. I know your daddy. I was like, my dad is Ray. But they always put us together because we've got the same name. I, the funniest thing was when uh, we were doing Red Walker, former sheriff of Shelby County. And they, I remember in the, the obituary, he had the Reverends Don and Donnie Acton doing the <laughs> funeral. So yeah. I thought it was pretty good. But, yeah. Brother, have at it. Thank I'm, you for being here today. I, I appreciate I it. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I got a brother and a sister-in-law sitting back here, and we had a reunion down in uh, Alabaster yesterday, and uh, my mom was one of seven youngsters in uh, Rocky Ridge Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Her daddy and my grandpa was an uh, elder there for many, many, many years, and uh, so they stopped on the way back from Gadsden. He is a uh, a minister still preaching, uh, and uh, glad to glad you could stop by uh, there. My wife Mary, uh, 50 years ago today, I was the pastor of New Hope Church. Uh, time has a way of uh, sneaking and just going right by, and uh, I remember so many good things about uh, our experience here at the New Hope Church. Uh, I believe that I was uh, uh, really inexperienced and Robert Lacey uh, came to General Assembly and it, uh, that, uh, uh, and I was the Minister of Youth and Recreation at our largest church. Dr. J. Fred Johnson was a senior pastor, great man of God, we were taking in, uh, every month we were averaging 25 members uh, 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 joining the church or growing at 25. We were over 1,000. And I uh, coached before I started to preach, and then I played college sports. And uh, they had a, a youth program up there that had a lot to do with recreation and competitive swimming. And I got that job, and it was a great experience for me. And Robert, General Assembly was meeting at the first church. Robert Lacey came to me during that week, and he said, we're without a pastor. Would you be interested in coming to New Hope? Well, if the way the crow flies, Wade and I were born about six miles right here from where we, where we grew up. And I had not preached or pastored uh, in the area that I grew up. So I said, yes, I would, because I had already told Dr. Johnson, I miss preaching. And that's how I came to New Hope. Now, I mentioned Robert Lacey because he was the person that contacted me. He was part of the pulpit committee, but I learned to appreciate what he did for New Hope Church. I want to tell you one other thing. A, the time that I was here, we had, a, we had 30 young people. And uh, we didn't have a place to go to camp. And I was over at Carl Ed Dudaway's uh, house one day, and it was convenient for me to slip over there during lunchtime because I knew I was going to get a great meal. <laughs> Wasn't any doubt about that. So I was over there, and I saw that beautiful farm there, and I asked him who owned this, and he, he told me. I said, wonder what's a, bill, a possibility of us uh, trying to talk him out of enough land to build a camp. And you know, Carl Ed just took the bull by the horns and he took off with this thing. And the first thing I know, we were at his office in downtown Birmingham. And it wasn't long after that till we met for a deed transaction. And we were able to receive that and build Camp Spain uh, at that point. Carly had done away in heaven, I think, is an all-American in life. Uh, he was a gentle guy that was friendly and had a great family and loved his wife and, and, and just was a great individual, and I remember that very well. So that was indeed a great opportunity for me to give thanks to this church for what they, uh, what they were able to do. And many of you will remember that Mary and I left here to become the executive director of the Alabama Sheriff Boys and Girls Ranches. 
And we started from scratch with that program, and we were able to believe when we retired 15 years later from there, we had 250 boys and girls in our facility, and we were training them and loving them and getting them to be responsible people in society rather than to fill our jails as it was so up for them to do at that time. And I was able to travel Alabama, raise the money, hire the staff. We hired the Bensons from here. Uh, Gene Lacey was, uh, came and, ministered and was a vital part of our staff down there. And uh, New Hope played a real part. Uh, Jimmy Turner gave us, I guess, thousands of dollars worth of light fixtures. You know, she could talk you out of a gold tooth if you had one. <laughs> And so we were grateful for that. And so New Hope has a very special place. But let me tell you something very special, Donnie. In 1832, in 1832, there was a preacher rode a horse from Nashville, Tennessee, and right over there somewhere near that old building, there was a brush arbor set up. Under that brush arbor, there was a revival and the New Hope Cumberland Presbyterian Church had its beginning in 1832 in that Brush Arbor meeting. My great-great-grandfather was a part of that. And they were, the Rocker Ridge Church was a part of that, uh, that, uh, that, that started right here, there. But you know what? I've gone to bed many times at night. I wonder how, I wonder who, where that old boy stayed that came down here to preach. I'm serious. I wonder how, where he got the food for his horse. But you know, it was, it's, a, it's amazing to me when I see the past and try to connect that past with the future. When I see all of the evil things that are taking place today, it breaks my heart. Whenever I see the the atrocities of evilness and how that the devil has just turned things around, I believe that it's time for the church today to go back to the Pentecostal church. I believe it's time for the church to get back to what they did on the day of Pentecost. I, am a, I'm, I like to go back to the history of the Covenant Presbyterian Church because I love it so much but I want you to know it was in a lot better shape in the 50s when I began to preach and when I grew up and when I had my teenage years when church camps were on fire for God and when they were overfilled and when, when preachers were begging to teach at camps. Now you can't get some preachers to get off the stool of do nothing and be at camp and teach camp and do the things that needs to be done. But back then, and so... We have come to a time today whenever we are experiencing some great extensive evilness. And when I retired from the full-time ministry in 04, I wasn't ready to stop preaching. And I said, Lord, I want to keep preaching. And in the East Tennessee Presbytery, we had several churches that didn't have resident pastors, never did have. But there was a little, little church that invited me to preach called Coalfield, Tennessee. Now, if you go through Coalfield, going to the Kentucky out of Knoxville, if you blinked one time, you missed Coalfield. <laughs> but there was a neat little Cumberland Presbyterian church there, and uh, I preached there. And I've been preaching there ever since for 11 years. Mary and I love it. They are good people. Uh, uh, we experience uh, spirituality there. And, and as I did here this morning, congratulations. But, but we've got to understand where we get back to. before uh, we've, we've got to get a new starting point. And I wanna, I've never been one to be concerned about stats and surveys until I learned that they're almost within three or four points of being free, of being true. So whenever I read three years ago 
that the Southern Baptists, for the first time in the history of Southern Baptists, has lost membership. They've done that last year and this year. That's never been heard. They have baptized less. Now, I'm, 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 I'm not picking on Southern Baptists. Uh, I, I told uh, the people in Tennessee that Southern Baptists has taken Alabama uh, like kudzu, and they're just about taking Tennessee like that, just sort of kidding them a little bit. But anyway, uh, they lost members, and that's not, that's not normal. And then the Cumberland Church had more people in Sunday school and church in the 50s than they have today. Now you think about that. So where is the problem? Where do we find? Where do, where, where do we see our jails overflowing? Where do we see 47% of every church member in America goes to church on Sunday? Where are we seeing uh, the procrastination of delay and, and I'd rather play golf on Sunday than to be at church and I'd rather have my, my youngsters in a, in a travel league that I can't go to church on Sunday because I got soccer matches 250 miles away. Now, I, I, am, I, I have four letters in college sports, football, baseball, tennis, and believe it or not, basketball, but that's, that's sort of a little oddity. Our basketball team was in the reserve in 1953 to 52. They were activated. And the president of the college came to me and he said, Don, you football, uh, to the coach, he said, you football players, and I happen to be captain of the football team, he said, y'all are going to have to play the, the, the basketball tournament. We can't cancel all these things. You never saw such a clowns in your life as you saw basketball, uh, football players trying to play basketball in college. Now, that was something else. But anyway, we, we see the things that are happening today and I just really believe that one thing that the churches need to do today, Donnie, and I made a little, uh, uh, I, I made a little outline and shared it with my people over at Coalfield uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I have never in my 59 years of preaching felt the whole power of the Holy Spirit like they did then. Now, I can't take credit for that because I didn't know I was going to do that. I said, God, my heart's heavy for what's happening today. Our young people, our, our old people, how people are experiencing difficulties in life and how that we don't see the joy in salvation and we don't see the joy in going to church and we let every little thing creep in between us and being what God really wants us to be today and, 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 and what the scripture says about us. And then, this is going to shock you. If I can get it out of here. Here is a picture of a preacher right here. Happened to be Presbyterian USA, and he doesn't deny it, and they don't either. So he doesn't believe in God. He's an atheist. And uh, nobody has asked for his ordination papers. And that just tore me apart when I read this. And when it came from the headquarters of the USA Presbyterian Church or uh, in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Now I want to read you two or three things here and then I'm going to hurry through what I believe is the answer for these type of things that we have today. <clears throat> Religion is a human, is human constructed. God didn't have anything to do. There's not a God up there. So the humans that came and, uh, you know, in the beginning, God created everything. But anyway, he said that's just a human thing there. And then secondly, Jesus may have been uh, uh, historically 
a historical figure, but he was just a legend, that's all. No cross, no birth to, the, to, 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 a, uh, uh, to a lady that had uh, virgin, no, none of that. He's a, he just said that's the way it is. And then he goes on to say, God is a symbol of myth. God is a symbol of myth. And that disturbed me tremendously. And then human consciousness is the results of natural selection to there's no hereafter. Okay. And then another little piece of paper right here. The National Black Churches Initiative, NBCI, a faith-based coalition of 34,000 churches uh, in compromising 15 denominations and 15.7 million African Americans has broken fellowship with the Presbyterian Church USA following all of the liberal approaches that they have. You know what I say to my black brothers? Amen. God bless you. So I said to myself, God, I don't know how to feed my, fam my church family, but I want you to help me. God, would you please give me an outline of what I can tell my people that we need to get off the stool of do nothing and quit leaning back on our thumb and sitting on our fist and get to work and bring this Pentecostal power back to our churches. Let us get to where we need to be, God. Let us reflect the redemptive love of God. Let us reflect that the only way to heaven is by way of the cross and let us reflect that there is a heaven Amen. and there is an eternal place of damnation called hell and we don't need to apologize for that and we need to make sure that our children and our young people know how much Jesus loves them and how much he wants to strengthen them Amen. that they can grow up to become a witness to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and if we fail to do that who's going to, be, who's going to get them the evilness of the day I don't have to go to all of the extents of, of, of the ugliness that's going on today from the shooting in the theaters and the, and the beheading people and, and, and look what happened in Chattanooga just a little ways from us. And I think about, wouldn't it be nice if that boy that killed those five service people in Chattanooga was in a choir like this and playing an instrument and singing praises to God, those lives would have been spared. Somebody may have had an opportunity to reach him. I don't know. But we have got to be up and about the Father's business because that's what he said that we are to do. And when churches fail to commit to evangelism and fail to uh, admit to dedication of the Word of God as it is printed without anybody adding anything or taking away from it. This is God's Word. The Bible is true. There, and from Genesis to Revelations, we just, have to, we just have to go by it. One verse of Scripture is my text. In the beginning, God created. And if we read the whole chapter, you can't sit still. You've got to be so happy and and, and I, 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 I see every day the, the handiwork of God and the glory of God in, in how he split the water into land and how that he made the trees and how that he gave us the flowers and all the things that the first chapter of Genesis tell us. And then we got some guy come along here saying, oh, that's just a wish. That, don't worry about that. There's nothing to that. You know, and I said, boy, I wish he really knew my God. I tell you, I wish I knew, I, I, I would love for him to know who my God is and to do the things that I would, I would want him to do. Now, here's, here, here's what we can do as a church. Here's what New Hope can do. Here's what Mount Carmel can do. We can come together and listen 
to this verse of scripture. God is the creator because Genesis said so. God is our God and father of all and above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure. God is a spirit. John 4, 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in the truth. Where is God? God is in heaven. Matthew 6, 9, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Isn't that rich? Amen. What does hallowed mean? That means the best there is. That's the top. And I, I pray every night the Lord's Prayer when I lay down because I love the Lord's Prayer. But I do a little bit of change in my Father, not ours, and then I leave, I use the word ours, but I like to him to know that here is an old, old boy preaching the gospel that I'm, he's mine. And, 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 and I want him to know that. And so, my Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How great is that? How, how you feel the power of the Holy Spirit when you begin to believe the Word of God. You then plug in to the power of the third part of the Holy Trinity, which is the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And how rich is it that we're able to experience the power of of the Holy Spirit. I had a wonderful, a wonderful, I won't call her an old maid, that's not uh, kosher anymore. I call them unclaimed jewels. <laughs> and she was a wonderful elder, a wonderful teacher in the church at Lebanon, Tennessee that we were at. And and we had some things going on and and and, and she told me one day, she said, I just believe sometimes we don't know how to pray right. But I tell you what, God spoke to me, and he said, let the Holy Spirit, Alma, let the Holy Spirit do your prayer. That's right. Let the Holy Spirit do your, and if you're connected to the Holy Spirit, he's gonna, he's gonna, he won't leave you standing. That's right. He won't leave you, he won't leave you without. That is absolutely uh, for sure. So, God can be found in the temple. Where is God? Who is God? Where is he? God can be found in the temple in the back of chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And here's where we build up the power of the Holy Spirit. God, I'm not capable, but I know one thing. I know you saved me by your amazing grace. And I know that there is power in the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to believe that power. And I'm going to open my life to receive that power. And God is going to use us. And that's what we've got to, rather than shooting somebody, love them to death. You know, just, and, and to do the things that we need to do. In Psalms 139, listen, in verse 7 through 10, we find that God is everywhere. Whither shall I go to thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into the heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even thou shalt thy hand lead and guide me, and thy right hand shall hold on to me. What is he saying? I'm not going to lose you. I'm going to lead you. I've got a good grip on your life. And we've got to move right along and, 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 and be where we need to be. So, you know, God is, is, is and one, what did he say? He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Oh, Dr. Waddle, Donnie told me he had him. He was a wonderful Bible professor. I loved him. And at Bethel College, and he said, uh, he said, preacher boys, and uh, that was before we were having an influx of, of uh, ladies coming into the ministry, and 
I would like to have been along at that time. I think we could have had some real good in, uh, uh, meeting because I attended in 1951 when I was on the football scholarship in Mississippi. I went to a lady, Cumberland Presbyterian preacher, Miss Levator Creel, and uh, uh, because there wasn't a Presbyterian uh, uh, church in the little town I was in, but uh, but anyway, whenever we we get we get to the power of that Holy Spirit, said so I want you to go into I want you to go into the whole world, and I believe our churches are tied into the Scripture in the last chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Just, just, just let's, let's try to reach the people that's lost. Let's try to redeem the church. Let's try to make sure that we're committed to, to lost souls. Let's make sure that we rear our children in the love and the admonition of the Lord. With the help of the church and with the help of the environment that the church creates, we can teach our children with all there is in electronics and everything else today. There is a power that's greater and that power is the Holy Spirit. It is the power of Almighty God. It is the greatest of all that will keep us in the direction that we want to go. And I believe it's worth it. Amen. I believe it's worth it. Wade and I, Wade's a little older than I am. Five of us boys, we lost our mom at the age of 39. She went to bed one night after having some surgery and never woke up out of her sleep. I never, went to, I never went to bed as long as my mom lived and my dad that we didn't have a family altar. Every single night I didn't miss one. A Bible story or a scripture and a prayer. And my mom died in 1946. I was 13 years old. And I had gotten saved, gave my heart to the Lord in July of 46 at the A.H. for Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Old Brother Watson was preaching a revival. Just an old white frame building down there. Church was full every night. Wasn't any, any emotional thing other than the fact that I felt assured in a calm way that I wanted to be a Christian and he invited me to come to the altar to accept Christ. I was the only one that went that night. But I accepted Christ and what a joy there's been. And on October the 8th, the same year, when that hearse left our house down a gravel road, to Highway 280, I was tremendously upset. I didn't understand why God would allow such to happen as normal 13-year-old would do. My mom was a loving, Christian, dedicated mom. And so I was angry at, at what I knew about God. I'd just been saved since July. And it was time to harvest corn. My dad had a dairy farm. And I walked off down there. My grandpa had come over to the house the morning we found my mom dead. And, and his preacher, Brother Cross, was preaching at the Acton Memorial Presbyterian Church at the time. And he came over and always went to Bible school at Rocky Ridge in Acton Memorial. And I sat down between two rows of corn and I began to cry. And I felt somebody hit me on the shoulder. And I looked up and old Brother Cross at that time was 80. He had the most beautiful head of white hair I've ever seen on anybody. I don't have any up here, but, but he had a beautiful head of hair. And he said, son, what's the matter? I told him I didn't understand. And he said, Don, let me tell you something. You remember in Bible school we studied about Jesus? Yeah. Do you remember how old we found Jesus to be? And 
I said, yes, sir, I remember that, Brother Cross. I, we, we say he was about 33. Your mom was 39. He paused and he said, Jesus, your mom outlived Jesus six years. That just smoothed it all over. Never questioned Jesus anymore. And what a great feeling to have the Holy Spirit speak things to you. I think we got three or four more minutes over here. Betty told me if I didn't quit that everybody would go home at 12. <laughs> no, she didn't. A couple of things right here. Uh, God is in our hearts. John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. And I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you, listen to these pronouns now, and I will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth which the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Now see, when we're lost, we, don't, we got to have somebody to, to lead us to the Spirit. We got, we got to get into the presence. Brother Watson led me right down to the altar, you see. This is where the churches have got to come together and, 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 uh, and, 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 but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, I want to close right here. God sees everything. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. It is of great importance that God sees the good and the bad. He can save the bad, and he can bless and strengthen the good. Isn't that rich? And whenever I try to tell my young people today, I have a good group of teenagers in a little rural church, which is highly unusual, and we have a sticks program that we put on, and, and, and Donnie, they were, uh, uh, back in March, they were asked uh, to uh, open the, the, the East Tennessee Young People's Christian uh, conference that they had of teenagers. Uh, 2,000 people were there. This little church, this little country church uh, in Coalville, Tennessee, Mount Carmel, had a sticks program. They put sticks in their hands and they can build a cross. They can build an altar and they can, they can uh, do the Christmas program or the Easter program, whatever, and, and full lighting and full uniform. I, I can brag on them because I don't have anything to do with it. I just, I just move them on. Uh, the, the, the lay leadership does the, does the work. But you know what? They, they went, they appeared, and they, out of 2,000 people, a converted Catholic is in charge of, of, our, of, of our sticks program. There were 60, 60 teenagers came down without a preacher saying a word. Of, came down and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ Hallelujah. at our little church. A little country church with 65 members and 14 teenagers were able to witness and, and, and be a part of 60 young people coming to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. We churches, God is depending on us. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek forgiveness. I will tell you one thing, and if you could see the evil of the day that this scripture has told us in Second Chronicles, whenever you see the condition of the times of that day and how that they had turned their back upon God just like we have today, then we can understand this more. He said, if you'll do these things, if you'll confess and if you'll pray, I will restore you. I will restore you. I want to tell you what, there's no other way to be restored save that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let him empower you 
as pastors, as elders, as deacons, as people who go to church. Let us be empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ who loves us and cares for us. I want to close. I've had wonderful, wonderful experiences. I spent, I have three vocations. I was a coach before I became a preacher, and then when I became a preacher, I became a worker for needy kids. And by the way, many of you that are here were supporters of that. And we know of three millionaires. One of the boys that's a millionaire's mother was a prostitute in Athens, Alabama. The other two boys, their parents chunked them out before they were 12, and they're millionaires today. And, and, and uh, uh, great Christians, all three of them, tremendous. Lynn's a member of the First Baptist Church down in Montgomery, and the other two uh, are, are just great people there. But anyway, uh, on March, I mean on January of 13, I was diagnosed with stage three cancer, aggressive. 10 of the biopsies they took were cancer. Well, cancer runs in my family. So you can imagine how I felt about that. And so we had a little meeting with my doctors and everything and we had a choice of plans and so forth. And I took those. I, I told him which one, I said, doctor, he was a young doctor, I said, if, uh, if, if I were your dad, which one of these plans would you take? And he told me. I said, let's get on it. That was in January. Donnie, in the last day of December the same year, my cancer was zero. Amen. Zero. I had churches, there are four churches in Coalfield, this little rural community. Two, uh, two Baptists, a seven-day Adventist, and a Cumberland Presbyterian. Every Sunday that year, all four of those churches were praying for me. And others too, everywhere. But see, this community was just like this together. Every Sunday night, we have a fifth Sunday night singing, and, and all the churches, we rotate around. Mm -hmm. And buddy, you have to, I tell you, if, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. Just like y'all <laughs> were this morning. That was good. And so then in, in uh, the next month after I had my cancer, macular degeneration hit in my right eye. I couldn't read. <laughs> They couldn't give me glasses because this eye was so messed up that I, they couldn't adjust this one. So I, I started reading. I, I, got, I, got, I got people to read my scripture, and I kept on preaching. Didn't miss a Sunday. In 13, in, in 013 and 014, I did not miss one single Sunday preaching. And now I can see pretty good because I've been getting a shot in this eye for the last year and a half and it's really helped. So you see God's still at work and, and, and I have physically felt good all the way through. Had not one effect of the cancer treatments. No side effect whatsoever. Yeah. Wade's got the same cancer now and they're working on him and I, I just know he's going to be alright. Yeah. And, and so forth. So we just keep plugging along. Don't get mad at Donnie for having me today. I called him, and what I'm doing at 82, I've pastored six churches, and I've asked every one of them, I just love that, being your pastor. I want to come back and just see what it's like. You don't, I don't want no honorarium. I don't want, I don't want, I just want to preach for y'all one more time. And every one of them has said yes. Amen. And you know, I'm looking forward to it. Mary and I both, next year, that little girl back there is going to be, we're going to be married 60 years. And that's 60 years of preaching. I'm still going. Stand up, Mary. You might not be able to see her. can't see her. Stand up. But she has been, 
I know you think the same thing, but I, absolutely, she's been the best preacher's wife you could ever want. Uh, she, we met at Bethel College. And Donnie, my dad sent four boys to Bethel College, and every one of them married Tennessee girls. And heart. daddy said, let me tell y'all something. Bethel College is, is just a, a matrimonial paradise. <laughs> <laughs> so so, uh, so that's, that's worked out pretty good right there for sure. Donnie, thank you for letting me come today. And I, 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 I feel good about this church and where you are. And you keep up the good work. And let's, let's turn this thing around yeah, for God. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Little yeah. by little, right. step by step, we can get this thing together. I love these kids that came Isn't down great? here this morning. Yeah. I want them to be churchmen right. and church ladies and preachers and whatever they choose to be, but we want them to be born again yeah. Christians right. who will serve right. the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Coalfield is right at the base of the Appalachia Mountains on the Tennessee Kentucky border. And if you ever come up there, visit us at Mount Carmel Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We're going to close out with singing I Surrender All. I think it's appropriate because Amen. Brother Don shared with us, I think it's important this day and time. We can't do it on our own. It's got to be the power of God. Amen. And so let's surrender ourselves to the Lord today. Great. If you've never received Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, it would be a great day to do that. Amen. And then secondly, if you are in any kind of distress today, you hear the testimony, what God has done in Brother Don's life, if you need prayer, I want you to come. Let's Amen. Pray. Amen. I surrender all. <clears throat> all to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust I surrender.
Ah.